Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the NE Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. I used to think about it more, but when you reach a certain age, you know who you are. Now I live in a little room out in the country behind a bar. Work four nights a week. In between, I drink. And there ain't nobody there to stop me. I know who I am. After all these years, there's a... There's a victory in that. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. And we're back on a Monday to bring you... No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) We go through this every week, and I can't get you on my side, Tommy. I I mean, my thing is, is like, I, I, I think we make a great show, and I think it's fun, and I have a great time doing it. And that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Tonight's show is going to be fun, too, because on the show tonight, Mike McGinnis of Fight Amp, Low Dose, Knife Hits Records, so many great bands. I mean, come on. What more could you ask for? I mean, I'm anxious to hear some of the old Fight Amp stories, because I remember (laughs) that band was pretty wild. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Big time. You know, it's funny, before the show started, or we log into the show, first of all, Tommy, were you concerned, or I didn't send you the link for the show until 6.01? Did you think I died? No, no, no. Um, I was a little concerned when I saw it was 6 and I hit refresh, but I'm always concerned that it's my fault. (laughs) I'm never (laughs) concerned that it's yours. Like I'm always like, damn it, what did I do wrong? Am I in the wrong email account? Fuck. I was playing uh, Doom to unwind. And then I was like, holy shit, it's 6.01 and I haven't sent Tommy the link. And then he always, he always logs in and he's like, how are you doing? And I just, I freeze because I'm like, do I talk about it now? Do I talk about it on the show? Oh, I don't know what to do. So we decided that on the show. So we were going to talk on the show because then it's like a real, like genuine reaction. It's not just, you know. Oh, I've already heard this. Ha 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 ha. That story was funny. Like, you know. Yeah, then I'm like acting. I'm yeah. like, welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. It is yeah. great to talk to you, Tommy. And you're a good actor. I'm terrible. I would be <laughs> like I would be awful at that. Well, here's what's going down. Ready? This past weekend, I hung out with a friend in Tompkins Square Park in New York City, and I saw bands play actual music live in the park. That was really weird, man. I haven't seen that in a long, long time. That's cool, though. Like, were they uh, good bands? Yeah. The two bands I saw were good. One was a girl and a guy. The guy was playing acoustic guitar, and the girl was singing. And then they did a cover of Whole Lot of Love at the end, and someone jumped on the drum kit and played. That was cool. The first band who did the Led Zeppelin cover, No Grudges. And the second band was Data Pool. They were decent. They were like a experimental punk type band. It was just amazing to see live music again. It's like such a rare thing these days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And all the little like Lower East Side punk and goth kids were there sitting on the ground smoking weed with their dyed hair and their interesting clothing. It was it was nice. It was a good sight to see. That's uh, yeah, like teenager kind of kids? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what, you don't approve of that? I I just always feel bad. Like when I see kids like wearing goth stuff and they're like younger, I'm like, okay, good. When I see it on like an adult, I'm like, what happened? Like, did you, 
not grow out of that? Like, I don't understand. When I see it on an adult, I say, what is your phone number? And may I have it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate, there's two things about that. One, I appreciate their dedication to it because they're just like, fuck it. I'm going with this for, this is like, I'm down for life. The other part of it is though, is like, do you still, cause there's only a, like a, there's a finite pool of that type of music. Do you just continue listening to the same records? Is it like, all right, I'm just going to put Bauhaus on again and then like. Yeah, you know. that's what they do. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Well, it was nice. I was outside. I was walking around. I was listening to music. It felt like normal life again, Tommy. Normal life. Not just sitting inside on YouTube, watching Sopranos clips on Twitch, playing video games, going to sleep in fetal position, getting up, playing video games again. I was outside. I listened to Daggers, the new Jim Ward record. Oh, yeah. So good. It's out now. And I listened to, oh, Vadim turned me on to a newish band, uh, this band called Axis. Check out the 2015 record, Show Your Greed. Oh, yeah. They're, dude, they, uh, I've heard of them. Uh, yeah. So- Sonny posted them a while ago. Yeah, they're really noisy, like yep. dead guy, kind of chaotic hardcore. Yeah, there's a really good stuff. Really, really good live clip of them that uh, Hate Five Six put up probably two years ago. Really, really good stuff. I got a dose of regular life again Saturday, and now I'm hooked. I'm looking forward to the potential end to being inside all the time and maybe getting outside and doing more stuff. And that that was when I listened to music when I commuted and when I was walking around on subways. That was when I listened to all my music. So. It's been cut down a lot in in the pandemic, and I want to get back to pre-pandemic life. I want you to get an outdoor hobby. Oh. <laughs> well, this I've been meeting this friend in the park every Saturday, so we just sit there and bullshit and feed squirrels and, you know, so that's that's something. That is good. That's nice. Yeah, I like uh, that. And take note, I asked how you were first. No, I just jumped in and started talking. I yeah, beat you to the punch. But no, that's how I started our conversation before we started recording. I'm like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so what's up with you? What's going down? Uh, not much. Uh, last few days of school right now. Winding down really, really heavy. Uh, lots of kids not showing up anymore, like for in-person instruction. Uh, one of my classes today was four people. Um, everybody else was on Google Meet and just behind a camera are butterflies hatched this weekend butterflies oh yeah i saw you posted that on instagram what is the deal with that are you are you smuggling butterflies into the country or something uh no what happens is is that uh, my mom raises a ton of just uh herbs and and spices and stuff at her house and last year uh, towards i guess like august or so her entire basil plant was just covered with these caterpillars um, so my mom started looking them up and she found out there are these caterpillars that turn into these black swallowtail butterflies. So my mom looked up, well, how do you, how do you raise them? What do you do with them? And essentially what my mom did was bought this little kit, uh, and you know, it was like 14 bucks or something like that on Amazon, uh, bought all the kind of stuff that you need to make sure that they're safe. And, uh, you basically let them make their cocoons and you put them in your refrigerator for six months. And then when it's warm again outside, you take it out of the refrigerator and you put them back in their little uh, mesh tent and you make sure the temperature's decent outside, like, you know, 75 and above and you let them sit there and eventually they just hatch one by one. And they did. Yeah. So we've had, that was the fifth one that's hatched that the one that we showed. Wow. It yeah. looks so wholesome. The kids are messing with butterflies, and the baby isn't even a baby. That's like a toddler now. Oh, yeah. No, she's uh, she's rapidly approaching two years old. She will be two years old October 1st, so she's, she's in that 19, 20-month range right now, so yeah. I got to get down there. I missed the whole baby. I know. Well, here's <laughs> the thing. With a baby, you don't miss much. This is the fun age. This is like the... You can run around and play with them and tell them to do funny things and yeah, games make sense, you know, like that kind of thing. When they're a baby, it's like they're like a, a, like a bag of sugar that you just make sure doesn't die. I think I prefer that because I run out of energy pretty quick. So 
you know, the kids want to play. I'm good for like a minute. And then I'm like, all right, I'm going to go sit down over here now, like a bag of sugar. No, surprisingly enough, they, they're really easy with, uh, if you have them outside, especially her age, they like, honestly, like kind of like dogs, they want to play fetch. Like I'll just throw stuff and she'll go run and get it and then come <laughs> back to me and hand it to me and be like, look, she'll be like, daddy, do it again. Well, next Saturday, I'm getting my next and last COVID shot. And then I'm going to wait the two week period. They tell you to wait. And then I'm just going to show up at your house. I'll just move in for a couple months. I on well we have a spare room. Yeah. With a shower and a bed. Like we have a full bath in the basement with a bed, refrigerator, freezer, everything. Yeah. You're just welcome, more than welcome. I'll just stay there and we'll see what happens. I don't know. Maybe like something will happen. A band or like a second podcast, who knows. <laughs> <laughs> you, you imagine trying to do another podcast like trying to just come up with more ideas. It would just be you just sitting there with me being like being like all right, all right. All right. Uh next podcast fuck, we use all the ideas on the first one. <laughs> <laughs> it would just have to be like documenting your family life or something. <laughs> yeah, how boring would that be? Although, you know what? Uh, the girls watch this TV show. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it literally is this, like they watch this little girl go through life. And she, well, she lives in Manhattan, which is kind of interesting, but like, it's like her going to school and her playing with her friends. And I'm like, you're watching this girl live. Can you not get go live your life? Look, what are you doing? Like it's, it's the same thing. I get upset with them when they watch te- like they watch YouTube videos of kids opening toys and playing with them. That's an, that's like a new phenomenon because this morning while I was working, I had Twitch on and I was watching a guy speed run the legend of Zelda. A lot of times I would rather watch someone play it than play it myself. But with the Nintendo specifically, it's hard to get the games to work. You know, they always mess up or I'm in the middle of a game and it freezes. So I'm like, I'm like nervous to play it. F- just figured out recently the save function on my Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So I've been playing a decent amount, not a decent amount, but like, you know, once or twice a week, I've been sitting down for like half hour, 45 minutes at night and playing. What are you playing? Uh, Metroid. Ah. And that's one of those games that I don't like using the cheat codes with because playing through it is is challenging and i like that part but what i did find was and this is where (laughs) work was awesome with this um we have basically no line for the printer at work because we are not allowed to physically give the kids any worksheets or any manipulate you can't give the kids anything everything has to be on a computer so i went up to the copier and i printed out the old game power i think it was guide nintendo power Nintendo Power, uh, Guide to Metroid. Yes. So it has like the level maps and like all the, what, the order you should be getting all the, you know, things done, um, tips to beat bosses and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's doing pretty well. I'm, 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 I'm very pleased with where I am. I just got the, uh, laser one, like the kind of wave beam. I'm surprised we haven't talked about this. I'd love to hear this. Uh, check out Summoning Salt channel on, Oh, YouTube, yeah. Yeah. you uh, you've sent me links from them before. I just recently watched a video about the history of Metroid speed running. Yes. Really compelling stuff. And he is that guy. Does sometimes you click on those and you're like forty five minutes about Mike Tyson punch out. Get out of here. And, and it's great. It's a, the whole thing is engaging. I don't know yeah. how this kid does it. It's fucking amazing. It's and it's honestly, it is. He does a great job of. His voiceover leads up to exactly the part of the game. I can't imagine how much time he has to spend editing these poor things because he'll be like, okay, so when you get to here, people were getting to, you know, mother brain and they were finding this problem. And it's like, holy shit, this guy literally had to find all of this footage or recreate it himself. Like, this is fucking nuts, dude. Like, that's... Yeah, such- the the amount of time to pull all that footage and compile it must... It just must take a very long time. And like you said, those videos are not short. None of them are under a half hour. Like, they're all long. It's really, it's really cool, though. Well, we're going to talk to Mike McGinnis now. Enjoy. All right, folks, we're here now with Mike McGinnis. Mike, welcome to the show. What's up, guys? Great to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. It's uh, it's nice to hear from you. It's been a minute. It's been a long time, right? I guess a couple years, but haven't seen a lot of people in a couple years. So, 
Yeah. You know the last live gig I saw before the world ended was Plaque Marks in Bushwick? Oh, no shit. Uh, yeah. What was that, December of 2019, right? That was it. That was yeah. the gig. I hear you. I, you know, I didn't go much further than that, just a few more. I guess I did a tour, <laughs> a tour in February, but a little bit different. Did you get, did you have to end a tour early? No, no, Plaque Marks didn't, but it was, oh, okay. it was close. I mean, you're talking a matter of weeks for sure. Anyway, it's great to have you here. I'm excited to talk to you today. Let's, let's take it back a bit, Mike. Where did you grow up? West Effort, New Jersey. It's uh, about 20 minutes outside of Philly. Jersey was like a foreign land to me. I would only go there for shows sometimes. How was it? Like a typical suburban type upbringing? I guess it depends how you're looking at typical. I mean, the town I grew up in was pretty, it was a mix of suburban and rural. Uh, it, it was a lot of, half of it was farms and woods. And uh, we were only about a mile from the river. So it was a lot of like, you know, swimming in the river and stuff like that. Um, but it was suburban for sure. But, you know, we, again, about 20 minute drive from Philly, you could hop on the bus and, you know, a lot of us skateboarded back then and stuff and would come over to Love Park and South Street and stuff. So uh, so you ventured, how young were you when you were venturing into the city to skate? 14, maybe? I Something like that. Definitely young. I didn't do it much. Yeah. Just a handful of times. I mean, I'm pretty sure I, I'm pretty, my first Philly show ever, I think was the Kill Time when I was 14. Um, oh, wow. What show was it? Believe it or not, it was a uh, Free Mumia rally. I don't really remember any of the other bands. It was my high school band, not a yeah. band that really did anything. So I don't really, it, wa it wasn't one, of, it wasn't like a Bob Meadows show or anything like that, you know? I don't think I, Tommy, when did you first like start hanging out in Philly? I don't think I went down there until I started going to hardcore shows at uh, Stalag and, and Kill Time. Uh, I started probably when I was around 14 or 15, just taking the train to go skate love and city hall. But like going to shows in the city, I didn't go until, well, until Anthony turned 16 because he, I, I had to wait for somebody to drive me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. I, I started going shows in 99 in South Jersey, and I can't really remember if I had gone to a show in Philly in 99 or maybe if it, but but it was 99. I, I, I remember that year pretty clearly. Yeah, so we're close. It was 98 for me, and I was started okay. going to shows locally in Bucks County and then, you know, in Philly and Jersey pretty soon after that. But yeah, uh, yep. So, Mike, have you always been like, really into music yeah that's fair to say okay so how did you like how did you decide that you wanted to play instruments and be in bands i honestly i don't really know it just uh <laughs> it, it i just started playing guitar and listening to cassette tapes when i was really young and that's probably a likely story for a lot of people that do that stuff you know it's just it just sort of happens naturally and you gravitate towards it it feels good and keeps feeling good so you keep doing it so what are some of the early bands that made you think, all right, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to play, and I'm going to play in front of people. <laughs> well, I guess it depends on, it was such a mixed bag, because I skateboarded, so watching, mm -hmm. sk watching skate videos had a ton of influence. So, you know, hearing Black Flag and the Dead Kennedys and stuff through skate videos, and like old school hip hop too, like, you know, went a long way. But of course, you know, I'd be lying if I say that, you know, Earl... I wasn't influenced by MTV and and early new metal and stuff like that. So it it was a mix of punk and new metal and and then, you know, stuff like Nirvana and like maybe early pop punk stuff, you know. Right. There was such a mixed bag around that time. You had the alternative boom of the early 90s and there was a lot of interesting bands. You had some good pop punk stuff towards the later end of the era with Blink-182 and all that tons of hardcore bands that i was into i too was into new metal kind of when it was new because new metal wasn't new metal yet corn was still kind of this sort of underground interesting band and i don't know there was other random stuff i listened to soulfly for a minute deftones all that stuff same and i mean I, you know those bands while simultaneously listening to stuff like black flag and nirvana which led to the melvins it was sort of just this big mixed bag of stuff that eventually became a bridge to hardcore but then hardcore eventually was a bridge to even more underground older punk rock and indie rock and uh noise rock and really all of it 
Yeah, hardcore is kind of the bridge that takes you to places, other places, or it was for me. Like, once I discovered hardcore and saw my first real hardcore show, I was like, this is it. How the hell is anything else ever going to compare to this? Did you have an experience like that? I think so. I, I, You know, like, the first big metal show I went to, I think, was sometime in, like, if I had to guess, I would say, like, 96 or 97. It was, like, Machine Head at the truck. And, uh... But I wasn't really into hardcore yet. And that was sort of the, and, you know, Machine Head back then, I guess that's when they were sort of becoming a new metal band from being a more legit metal band before that. And uh, I, not to say new metal isn't legit, but you know what I mean? Like there was a, there was a, if you're familiar with that band, you know, there was a, there was a, a sea change. There was change. a jump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't really too into hardcore yet at that point. And I remember in 99, I kind of started going to like Soundwave Records in, a, in South Jersey and, full circle and they would just have local bands play and some of them were hardcore. And, uh, and then I started going to shows at hot shots in Westville and Joe was throwing shows there. So I can't really remember the exact moment, but you know, I was going, I started going to the kill time, you know, I, again, I don't really remember the moment. It was a lot of local bands and then seeing discovering converge, you know, like pretty early and stuff like that. I, I, Again, it's it's really hard to trace it back to the moment though, because it was just I, the memories are just so like jammed together at this point. Right, and those are right when I got into hardcore. It was Coles, Dillinger Escape Plan, Botch, Converge. Those were Cave In. Cave, those yeah. were yeah, those were like the defining bands. Same. I mean, that was you know you just listed the bands that I pretty much immediately gravitated towards. Other than some like, you know, I also kind of like stuff like floor punch and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But again, I kind of liked a lot of stuff. So it's it's hard to really know exactly where it was. But those bands you named, I mean, to this day, I like a lot of their records. So that's. Oh, yeah. I still listen to all of it. Yeah. So let's talk about some of your early days of playing. What was your first band? It was a band I was in in high school and it changed names a million times. I guess probably people would know if anyone was familiar with that era it was sh- short lived and we were high school kids and we occasionally would confusingly jump in the shows. But I guess the name it had for the longest was called pride of youth, which, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is funny. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's very, uh, you know, old school, hardcore sounded and didn't sound like that musically at all. Again, it almost sounded like, you know, Deftones was trying to write like a hardcore record or something poorly. That sounds really good. Actually. <laughs> it wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that that was, I guess that was the, but, but even before that, I, I played with my friends, and I don't know if, I guess we wrote songs and didn't play in front of people, and I guess those were bands, but I don't, I don't really know how to define it. So was Fight Amp the first band you were in that you kind of really took seriously and got around in? I think so, but the band before it that I was in with Pat Troxel, The Funeral Bird, uh, that definitely, that was something... Uh, I don't know how seriously we took it, but it was something that definitely taught some lessons and we wrote some cool songs. Um, but Fight Amp, yeah, if you use the word seriously, that was definitely, and it even took a few years in the Fight Amp to quote unquote take it seriously, you know? So. Right. So yeah, Funeral Bird. Pat told some pretty amusing stories when he was on the show, you know, that you guys would just drive around South Philly and look for a party and just show up and play. We definitely did that a few times. Early Fight Amp did that as well. Um Sometimes, though, it was more of a, wasn't just really driving around. It was kind of like, you know, knowing something was going on and knowing that we knew the promoter and showing up and, you know, saying, hey, man, we're going to play and kind of selling them the goods until they couldn't say no. So (laughs) (laughs) but Bob Bob Meadows definitely dealt with that a few times. (laughs) See, I like the idea of you just showing up to a random house party in South Philly where you don't know anybody and being like, hey, we're playing. And they're like, uh, okay. We we definitely did that. The, <laughs> the, the time I can remember most vividly was actually in South Jersey. And it was like, it was like just some girls like birthday party that a few friends we had that lived in the area knew was happening, but they rented out some hall and we showed up and played. So I don't know, (laughs) but I think, (laughs) I don't think it was just a party. Like I I think that they maybe had like a couple pop punk bands playing or something like that. So there was like a PA and stuff, you know, but, but again, the memories are a little wishy washy. So (laughs) that may, that may have happened. Right. I forget that we're like 30 plus years old now. Yeah, I know. 
How were those early experiences? You're in a band, you're cruising around playing shows. I mean, did you, where'd you play out in the, I guess around the tri-state area and stuff? Yeah, it was, I think the furthest that band ever went out of state was maybe like Southern Virginia. Look, it was by the seat of our pants and a total shit show, but it was, (laughs) but at the same time, it was a blast. I mean, we were kids, nothing mattered. So it's. Yeah. So how do you transition from Funeral Bird into Fight Amp? I think Funeral Bird just like, if I, I think we just broke apart, went our separate ways, and then, of course, still wanted to play music. And I think that, you know, I was just hanging out with some of the early Fight Amp dudes and other friends in South Jersey, just sitting in a garage, uh, you know, in between like pizza delivery shifts and, I think I was out of high school at that point. And like, yeah, it was just like a summer of just like, ah, you know, take the summer off and just kind of work a pizza delivery job and smoke weed and listen to music and hang out with this crew. And yeah, we just jammed until we had another, you know, just played a guitar while we were hanging out in this garage. Said, well, maybe we should get into a basement with a drum kit and make it happen. And we just did. I was surprised when you told me that uh, Sean, was Sean Force the original vocalist of the band? He was, I would say for... Because I was surprised when you told me that, because I, I knew he was in David is Burning, who I didn't see when they were around, because I don't know, I don't think I was going to that many shows. But Sean Force is probably one of the most interesting people I've ever met. <laughs> and and yeah. I met him, I met him like after he was done in bands. So just to think of him in that context now is kind of funny. Yeah, that's... Uh... I could I know exactly why you're saying that. Uh so, yeah. <laughs> um I've just never met anybody like him in my life. Oh, same. Um Yeah. Yeah, he uh he was one of the people in that garage with us just hanging out as like you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds whatever we were and yeah. uh you know, we were writing these riffs and all and we were like, man, we need a place to play and it he was just like, well, you guys can play in my basement if I can be the singer. And we we're like, well, okay, that works. And that, that's <laughs> how that happened. Yeah. So we, we wrote a lot of that demo in 2003 and then recorded it in early 2003 and then played out with those songs and some new stuff with Sean throughout 2004. Or no, we, we recorded it in early 2004. Sorry. And um, so he was like in the band for like the, the genesis of it, of it, you know, like in its embryonic phase and he enjoyed it. But then I think like, you know, just kind of wanted to do his own thing too. Um, yeah. But I love Sean to this day, you know, that's, he's a, he's a great guy. He is. I could jump in and say that like a thing Sean would do. And we're talking about like, you know, the year, at least for me, or like say 2003, when we were like starting this band, a thing he would do in the era of like, social media not being totally prevalent not everyone having the internet in their pocket he would do like internet deep digs on things that none of the our crew like had heard of and be like have you ever heard of this thing it's only popular in japan during this year you know and he would like (laughs) he would like check this out he would always have these like things like this is a thing and we'd be like no we never heard of it it's really cool you know like so that was the thing about sean that i always you know that always stuck with me was he would always have these little nuggets of like interesting stuff that you can tell he dug for, you know, with any other person I've ever met, I can be like, Oh, they're like this with Sean. I can't do that. He's like literally one of a kind. Yeah, I agree. I can't be like, I can't point to anyone else and be like, Oh, I know a guy like this. Yeah. (laughs) So how do you, Mike, how do you transition into the front man for fight amp? When does that happen? I was never really the front man. I mean, John actually did more vocals than I did, but we definitely shared the duty in a way, you know? Okay. Um, basically what happened was, and to go back to David is burning. Yes. When, when we, when we started fight amp, three of the five initial members were members of David is burning. It was Scott, Scott, Sean and Mitchell. Um, Sean didn't last long. And then Pat Troxel was the second singer, also didn't last long. So Sean is on the demo, Pat is on a two-song seven-inch, and those things happen rapidly over the course of like a year and a half. Um, Then our first EP, we were writing our first EP right when Pat left the band. And at that point, we were like, well, is this really the type of music that needs a front person? We're like, we're not a 
true hardcore band. It's something a little different. We were super into sludge and noise rock as well as hardcore and, and stuff like that. And, uh, so we just said, oh, I don't know. It's just, let's just slim down and do it ourselves. It was just sort of, it was just a decision like that. And then John and I shared vocal duties as we, as Mitchell left the band and we brought, uh, Lou who played in, uh, the funeral bird and eventually the minor times he came into the band for a little while, right. As we took over vocal duties, he actually did some of the initial vocals as well until he left. Was it nerve wracking for you at all to pick up vocal duties? Because when I, I've only done vocals in one band ever, like as a front person and my whole life, I always played guitar and I was just too afraid to try to sing. So when I finally did it, it was one of the most nerve wracking things ever. Did you feel that way at all? Yeah, hundred percent. And I honestly still do. Um, I would be happy. And I, (laughs) basically every time that I end up doing vocals now, and I've obviously gotten like better at it, but it's not better at it. I say like very carefully because I don't really want to be a vocalist at all. Um, So I don't, (laughs) so I don't really put work into it. And my main band now, I don't do any vocals and I'm happy to finally be back to just being a, a guitar player and a songwriter. And uh, my side project, Anxiety Spiral, I, of course, like it was, okay, well, who's going to do vocals? And I, I sort of get convinced to do it occasionally, you know? So, and that's what's happened in a bunch where it's like, okay, you know, even in the end of Fight Amp, I was trying to be like, ah, maybe John can just do all of it, you know? And, uh, you know, the the drummer, Dan, would con- increasingly convince me to do more vocals so yeah it's always been nerve-wracking i i like i'd prefer to not wear that hat to be honest i think that's refreshing to hear because i'm like constantly attention seeking and i want to be at the center of everything well most of the time at least so you know (laughs) i i would like put a lot of work i would show up to the studio by myself and just work on it and work on it until i thought it sounded kind of okay and i'm like i have to do this i want to do this but you're like i'll do it if i have to but i don't really want to yeah, that's just the way I feel about it. And I also put a lot of work into a lot of other things. And I just like, it's just not something that's a priority for me. Unless, again, unless it just kind of is where it makes total sense without putting a ton of work into it. Because it does take work. You know, it's, I guess some people are just really intuitive and they can just hit every everything they're trying to do perfectly. But I don't know. Yeah, I just don't really have a drive to be a vocalist. Well, I think your vocals are great. I was catching up with the Fight Amp discography, and I really like what I hear. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. So the work shows. (laughs) So that was a band for a long time, right? What was it, like eight years or something? Twelve. Twelve years. January of 04, conveniently, was the first show. And Mm -hmm. then our final tour was in early 20. 16 or late 2015 so more than yeah i i think i'm getting the dates right here so more than 12 but was it a th- and was it a three piece towards the end uh, i think it was a three piece for longer than it was anything else and that's i think that's the way to go because you know less personalities less chance of conflict in my experience yeah i i agree i mean you know two guitar players always has its place but uh you know it's if you could do it if the songs are okay with one guitar player, then, then yeah, that's great. You know, I, I actually remember the last tour and when it was announced that the band was, uh, was going to be dis- disbanding. You had an incredible last record constantly off. You, I mean, you've been around for all this time. And so, like, why, why the decision to end it? Well, the decision to end it didn't come before making that record or while w- making it. Um, it did come shortly after and saying, you know, even, even you appreciating that record, like that's part of it. We are super happy with that record. Uh, yeah. The production is great. I love the songs yeah. like, thank you. Sludgier music. I, I don't, I really hate when it's like super slow and boring and you guys have a bit of the sludgy angle, but it's like, I like song structure. I like songs to be songs. And I think this record has it all. Thanks. And that's what you just said was in writing those songs and making that album. That was a very, what you just said, like were words that came out of our mouths while, while we were making it like, Hey, like let's, let's, 
you know, you know how these things are really cool. Well, wouldn't it be cool if we didn't drag it out that long and kind of like, yes. added, you know, added some, you know, uh, ABAC kind of song structures. And uh, so it that was very intentional. But that's the fact that we were so happy with that record. And we started making we started writing another record and and uh, demoing for it. And we were. Even going into constantly off, we were a little shaky on like, dude, it has been a band for a while. We sort of plateaued and we realized we did something that we were really happy with. And we kind of felt like every record after that would take like a slight quality drop off because our we all were like wanting to do other things. And we wanted to expand genre wise a little bit and just explore other other stuff. And we just didn't want to be that band that just had this slow decline, like, Oh, three more records. And each one gets just a little bit, not as cool as the last one. So that, that we just like, let's just throw in the towel here and have a great ending note. You know, having the foresight to do that, I think is incredible because me, I get very comfortable. You know, if I'm like in an established band and I have my friends and we have our songs and I have all the connections, I'm like, okay, this is it. I'm going to keep doing this. But you're like Seinfeld. You're like, we're on top. We wrote this incredible record. We're going to go out on top. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it wasn't an easy decision. It's, you know, like that's, and of course there's always the doubt that like, yeah, maybe, maybe we do have a little slump and then we come back bigger and better than ever. But I I don't know. You know, it's, it just, once you're a legacy band, which we were, but we were, we weren't a big legacy band. We were still like a cult favorite you know yeah. it's it the uphill battle at that point especially getting into our 30s and and wanting to do other stuff to make time to say hey it'd be cool to you know maybe just take a little genre turn and we could have done that within fight amp but then you you know we get the well this isn't fight amp anymore so yeah i just it, it was a hard decision but i i'm pretty confident in it still so how did you feel after it was done? Did you have plans already for a new band or did you take some time off? What was what was the deal? Yeah, we like, I mean, John and Dan and myself kept playing together in low dose and that was sort of the genre turn. Um, so we like kept, we wanted to play music with each other, but we did like, you know, we hit the break. We did the final Constantly Off tour and we said, let's just take our time and take some time off and when while we're making, you know, we were we started writing music with Iteria for Lodos, and we we just decided to take our time with it and kind of focus on not being in the same band that was, you know, spinning the country a bunch. Now Lodos, this is an incredible band. I I know Iteria from back in the day, from going to shows. She said to say hello, by the way. Oh, awesome! Hey, Iteria, what's up? <laughs> I, I saw her earlier today. She said, "Tell Keith I said what's up." Oh, awesome. Yeah, and this this record is incredible. Now, I knew she played, but like, boy, she can really sing. And the record is super catchy, super heavy. So, shit, I just want to say I really dig it, guys. Thank you. I'm yeah, I'm it's another record I'm really proud of for sure. As well you should be. Is that is that band your main focus now? No, it's not. Um that basically we were like kind of hitting the brakes a little after we finished the cycle on that LP. And then basically when the pandemic hit, it just was very apparent that in particular, uh, John and Dan both had to focus on work. Um, and, mm-hmm. in, and in particular, John, he entered his union apprenticeship and just needed some time off from playing music in general. So we didn't really break up and there's always maybe in the cards that like we could, you know, we had some like unfinished songs and, you know, it's, it's not a like door closing situation by any means, but at the same time, like no one is focusing on it whatsoever right now. So maybe there'll be something in the future, but yeah, no, no one's really thinking of it at the moment just cause it, we can't. So, ah, so it's a situational type deal. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it's just the way it goes. It's not really that big of a deal because I, Terry, and I wanted to keep doing stuff, and we started Rid of Me, a new band. Right. And, you know, that that's my main focus at the moment. So Rid of Me is the new band with you and I, Terry, and that is going to be the focus now. Yeah, yep. And it, it has been. I mean, we have, you know, we did some short releases, and uh, 
we were supposed to tour with Soul Glow in the beginning of the year, but the pandemic happened, so the tour got canceled. Um, but we're booking shows again, and we have an LP coming out that we finished during the pandemic. So that's de- definitely working on it. How did you fare during the pandemic? How did you survive? Like me, I got deep into video games. Uh, my work life didn't really change because I work from home anyway, so I'm fortunate there. How was it for you? It's a mixed bag. I mean, you know, being able to take a step back and get some perspective was definitely a positive. Um, yeah. But at the, I, I also, I don't, I can turn on being a social person, obviously, you know, like uh, through touring and working at bars and stuff like that. But at the same time, like I really am not someone who shies away from my alone time and uh, oh, big time. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't mind not being that social. So that element of it didn't really kill me as much as it did some people and yeah, everyone's different. So if it, I know that was a struggle for some people, but that, that element of it wasn't that crazy for me. Um, so I definitely tried to utilize the time as best I could and learn some new skills and, got my label ramped up a bit and all, but obviously there are other things that are hard. I mean, you know, not seeing people that are close to me and stuff like that. Um, and you know, having to reinvent myself job wise and financially and stuff like that was, you know, a challenge, but I, I, you know, I, I, it definitely didn't hit me as hard as it hit a lot of people. It definitely could have been worse. Yeah, so how did you reinvent yourself job-wise? Because I, I think I met you through Doug when you were working at Kung Fu Necktie still. did you? How did you find other avenues of, uh, of income? I, I, I basically started doing a lot of DIY type of things. Um, on, you know, on top of government assistance, which I'm not shy to say because everyone deserves it, in my opinion. But <laughs> No, I'm, uh, I'm totally I, with you there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I... A, a multitude of things, basically being a multitasker, is, if, to, to put it simply. that If there's one regret I have in my life, I, I sometimes wish I would have done the hustling DIY and like focus on a creative passion type deal, because my whole life, I just kind of did what I thought I should do or what other people thought I should do, and I, I don't feel like I put enough into creative passions when I was younger. So when people kind of just make it work and and do their thing and put all their energy into the uh, the creative things, I really love that. But the good news is, uh, I have now found a creative passion that I can work around my career, aka this podcast. So it all worked out in the end. I mean, that's awesome. I I love that you guys do this. It's so that's that, that's really cool. Yeah, and it it was kind of a result of the pandemic too, because Tommy and I recorded the first four episodes right before the sh- lockdowns happened and i didn't know how often it was going to air or i don't know what it, what it was going to be exactly and then it just kind of became a weekly thing yeah that that's great i mean i'm a fan so oh well that's good to hear and now here we are and you're on the show can you believe it <laughs> no no i cannot <laughs> i was gonna say mike did you did you pick up like uh when you say diy stuff like did you pick up like real like construction skills and stuff like that so I actually come from construction before I was a bartender. So that, that is some of what I've been doing again. Um, but just mixing it in amongst other things. Uh, I, I was an electrician for five years, so oh. that's, uh, I've definitely been mixing that back in. I'm always impressed when I see, uh, Doug has that, uh, his Instagram page of like him fixing up that house. And yeah, I, always- I, it's impressive. I always look at it and go, when the fuck did Doug learn how to do flooring? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's fucking amazing to me. I'm like, Jesus, that's, this looks beautiful. It's like parquet flooring. I'm like, Jesus, it looks really, really nice. He like did such a great job with it. And I always think like, that's what I wanted to focus like during like the pandemic that was with me was like, all right, I have this time. I'm going to learn just some like basic construction stuff i wanted to make like my daughters are into skateboarding now so i was like i want to make some grind boxes let's make some ramps let's make some grind boxes let's keep them in the garage we have the space to store them like let's learn how to do this so it was just literally like sitting on youtube like all right okay yeah Cir- hell yeah uh, circular saw all right got that let's do did you get it done yeah i have two hell yeah so, awesome so yeah. I, have, I have two grind boxes and we have uh a really so my my kids are little like that the twins that skateboard are seven uh so we the quarter pipe we have is only two feet but so is that i didn't even know what a grind box was is that, is that a skating thing 
Yeah, it looks like um think like a bench, like a regular yeah. like uh but a bench without a back and then wood all the way around the bottom of it. Like just make I a see. Just literally make a box and then you know when you go to like um you know like loading docks have that big chunk of metal on the edge. Yeah. Like so the 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 concrete doesn't get damaged from uh trucks backing up. You right. basically attach that. So you just like drill through the metal and kind of oh, like Oh, so you can like jump in the air and grind along the the it, thing. Precisely. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I don't have the uh, skating nomenclature. Yeah, the but... <laughs> the vocab wasn't there, but the idea was. <laughs> they just the trick you just described, they just added it to the newest uh <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I was at the skate park the other day and the dude was like, I'm gonna jump up in the air real quick and <laughs> <laughs> and uh move the board along this thing yeah. <laughs> that's probably how they described it back in the day like do you think i could jump up real quick and like move the board along this thing i think you could do it if you try you know <laughs> i always thought like that was the funniest thing with like people naming tricks with skateboarding and it's like uh it's gotten like out of control because like people have like uh hey check out my instagram and like i you know they'll like have like a bunch of skate clips on there and people will be like name this trick and i'm like Okay, it's a hard flip. <laughs> it's a hard flip with a late flip. And people are like, I actually call those nightmare flips. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking well, about? Like, and, and now the trick you just described, like a five year old is doing it <laughs> <just> like for, <laughs> on, 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 on TikTok. You know what I mean? So it's like, of course, like, they're like, yeah. I call this the nightmare flip, but you sure do. Yeah. No, nothing is worse than like, so my, like my daughter, my one daughter's getting pretty decent now. And the other one doesn't really take it very seriously, but the other one like gets up early in the morning. She's like, let's go to the skate park before anybody gets there. I'm like, okay. Hell yeah. Um, she's like taking it kind of seriously now. And she's like, I want to see like uh, other kids skating. Can you show me? Like, so I found an Instagram page that's literally, I I forget what it's, it's, it has like the word Grom in it. like, like Gromit kind of thing. And I was like, all right, I'm showing it to her. And she's like, oh my God, this one kid's really good. And I was like, oh, let me see it. It's like an eight year old Japanese kid. And he is fucking destroying pools. Like things that are like adults. I look at a pool and I go, that has three and a half feet of vert on it. Like, I <laughs> yep. wouldn't, I wouldn't drop in on that. It's video and, games and it's and social it, media. It, it's pr- Mike, you nailed it. And it's like, yeah. it's almost like what we were like paying like Tony Hawk Pro Skater, like that type of thing. You're like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna grind this entire thing and land it to nose manual and then grind yep. something else afterwards. You're like, oh. yeah. To us, it was fantasy. Little kids were playing that and were like, I think I could go do that. You yeah. Know, it's- <laughs> to, to me now, I like look at it and go, if I didn't love this thing so much, I would fucking quit. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. like, it's so dis- it's so disheartening, yeah. but it's like at the same time, it's like, well, I really do get satisfaction out of this and I do look forward to it and I appreciate it. But there's also that part of me that's like, God damn it. Like I get to the park and I'm like trying to like just fucking like five O stall to like come back in on the like the five foot uh ramp and i get up there and every time i get up there and i'm stopped i'm like you're gonna fall you're almost 40 years old now like tommy a, a tommy million- you already you already lost a major organ so you you better be careful <laughs> that's a minor organ you're spleen you don't even need that i fucking made it i made it like 20 years so far and i'm still when good. you lose an organ any organ is a major organ as far as i'm concerned I'll- but listen <laughs> You got to be careful because you you have to be here for this show. I <laughs> yeah, mean, those, come on. Those kids can feed themselves, but this show. I, honestly, yeah. I, I, it's it's crazy. Once we started recording, I was going to be like, do you have your spleen? Because it really sounds like you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said he has the, that kind of voice. I, that's, I, I always in the beginning of the year. So like, Mike, I'm a, I, I, I teach uh, sixth grade math. And one of the th- like things I do in the beginning of the year is like an icebreaker thing is I play this game with the kids of like, two truths and a lie so you tell the kids three things two of them are true and one of them is a lie and yet you have to decide which one's the lie and the kids are always like you never lost it you had major surgery and lost the organ get out of here letting i'm like okay i'm not taking my shirt off in class however <laughs> um i will show you the pictures that my mom because i remember my mother took a camera into when i was in intensive care and she took pictures of me and i was oh like my what God. are you doing and she's like so when you <laughs> go to skateboard later i'm gonna show these to you <laughs> that is uh, th- that's such an old guy thing to do is like show pictures of your surgery oh yeah no yeah. and it's yeah. yeah can you imagine that like they go home and like, how was school today sweetie uh my teacher showed a bunch of pictures for him in <laughs> the hospital like okay we're gonna we're gonna have to call that school (laughs) so i'm I'm gonna shift off of skating now 
and I'm going to talk about Mike McGinnis's label, Knife Hits Records. Now, Mike, tell us about when this label started up and how. Well, uh, it pretty much goes hand in hand with the beginning of Fight Ant. So uh, the first release was the demo. Uh, and it was just a demo tape. So early 2004. And it was just a means of DIY releasing a, a demo tape to, yes. take on, to take on tour. It was mostly shared between myself, John, the bass player of Fight Amp, Scott, the original drummer of Fight Amp, and our friend, who you might know, Keith, uh, Big Kev. Yes. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. I know that, dude. Yeah. From back in the day, I remember Big Kev, Phil, uh, Mitchell, and then there was there was this other guy. Yeah, probably me. And to bring this whole thing full circle <laughs> is that garage in his backyard, which we converted, I did all the electrical work in, that was where Fight Amp started. No that shit. That's yeah. fucking crazy. Yeah, yeah. And oh, wait. he so he was very he wasn't in the band, but he was like the guy right next to us, you know, being like, Well, let me help you put out this tape, you know. So that's fucking awesome, yeah. dude. And get you high, you know. <laughs> you know like, Wait, yeah. So this is just for listeners that don't know what a knife hit is. Can Mike, can you elaborate just for a moment <laughs> for our uninformed people what knife hits are? Yeah, usually on an electric stove, you take two butter knives and jam them into the coil on the stove and you heat it up until they're red hot, and then you take any kind of improvised cone, usually uh, usually a, a two liter cut in half, and you take a nug, put it in between the two knives and incinerate it and into the cone and inhale it as fast as you can. And it gets you really high really fast. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea. I had never even heard of that. <laughs> like, again, this is all full circle. That's why it's called Knife Hits. Oh, yeah. So the label. So you're putting out uh, early Fight Amp releases. Between those four people, who were pretty much in charge of it. We put out that first demo tape, went on tour, you know, it was pretty, you know, we, we dubbed them ourselves, et cetera. Uh, and then big Kev wanted to, and this is kind of fast forward because the next seven inch came out on reptilian records. And, uh, so we're talking about once we picked up the vocal duties sometime, and I think it was Oh five, um, this all happened so fast back then. I think about the member changes and, it literally happened with like, you know, now a year, I just blink my eyes and it's gone. And I'm like, man, the th things that changed in the course of a year back then were insane. But uh, yeah, sometime in 05, we recorded our first EP with uh, Will um, from Bucket Full of Teeth and Orchid up in Amherst, Massachusetts. And four songs, we liked them. We didn't have a home. And Big Kev said, hey, like, let's let's keep knife hits going and I'll fund, I'll fund the release of the seven inch. And we had a bunch, we had, we were booking tours and stuff. So yeah, he, he championed that. And that was like the legit first real uh, knife hits release. And again, like me and John and Scott were there helping a lot as well as everybody else really. But th th that was the four main people that were really helping with putting the releases together. Uh, and then after that, I pretty much started to, I wanted to keep, going with it and there were other bands that you know we just started i i kind of championed it but with the help of that same cast uh including actually sean's little brother justin um he was in on it too and uh we did some cassette tapes for like gun of Om and like some of our friends bands from the time and then and like hulk smash you know they were at bj's band from philly um and but that was about it back in the day. It was sort of just, it became like a moniker. And I, so those were the early days and it kind of went to sleep for a little while. So it, it had like a second life. I would say when fight amp constantly off came out, uh, because I did a split release for that with brutal Panda records. And that's sort of when it started to pick up steam again. I see. So now you do you do you like work with other bands? Like will you sign bands and put out their stuff? Not sign at this point, but it's growing rapidly. Um what I'm doing is definitely working right now. Yeah. But it's at this point it is absolutely a one person operation. Clearly, like my friends help me. Um yeah. but back then it was collaborative. Now uh, you know, it is 
almost all me. And again, I couldn't do it without the help of some of my friends. Like, you know, a good example is Itaria is the head of shipping at her work. And she allows me to avoid going to the post office by going and shipping all the mail order I get through her rather than the post office. So things like that help, but it is still like a very, very much a one person operation. And, uh, I've been doing stuff for other bands. It's mostly been cassette and digital. I have a pretty legit distributor um, that I signed a deal with when I put out the Lodos record. Uh, so I'm doing stuff, but it's like reissues. And I, I but I put out like the new Ten Ton Hammer record, and I have other new bands that I'm putting out, like new records. And a lot of really cool plans coming up and everything. And I'm maybe about to bite the bullet back in the vinyl again. So it's growing, but I'm not at the point of like, quote unquote, signing bands, but I'm pretty close to be honest. So so how does it work? If you're going to work with a band, do you pay for them to record or like, how are you involved with them? So that isn't the way I'm doing things now. I'm definitely not on that level. It's way more shoe- shoestring as far as the budget's concerned. Uh, but It's pretty like industry standard that if a label pays for the recording, then they like get like they get a term on the masters where they get to like control the rights to it. And I'm not really I'm not really interested in that anyway. Like I would prefer for a band to control what they have and me just like put something out and sort of help them and have it be a symbiotic relationship. Uh, So it's not really a path I I'm like trying to jump into anyway. Do you have to, I was going to say before you, like you were just talking about like, you know, potentially kind of delving into vinyl. Do you have to sit down and think like, all right, if I'm paying X amount for all of these records, they have to be sold for a certain, like, do you have to sit down and like, cat, like crunch the numbers and figure out like, is this actually financially worth it? Yes. I, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I'm at the point now where I, ba- I basically, ev- Every Friday, I do the numbers for what I'm doing right now, and uh, I just I'm I'm back to that point, which is crazy. I didn't think I'd be doing this again or on this level, but it was sort of something born of the pandemic, where I was like, "Well, I'm just sitting here, like, uh, and I'm you know I helped write and record the entire Rid of Me LP. I started a new side project and and you know helped I you know co self recorded that and. Uh, did another thing for that, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, I, you know, I, I wanted to do something else music related that wasn't just my own bands. So focusing on the label was like just a cool thing to do. And, but I'm just, I'm also very hesitant. I don't want to, I don't want to bite off more than I can chew because I've had bad label experiences and I'd never want to be like that guy, you know, like I just, yeah. So I'm never going to, you know, I, I'm, I've had people be like, hey, can you put out our record? I've had a, tons of bands like come to me and I've politely declined because I'm like, hey, I'm just not there yet. I think you can find what you're looking for somewhere else at the moment anyway. All right. I was going to ask how you reject bands that you don't necessarily don't want to work. I tell them I'm too busy and normally that's the truth. So <laughs> <laughs> it's always good when the truth is the truth. You know yeah, what I yeah. mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't have to lie yet. <laughs> so what you said, you've had bad experiences with labels. Like what did someone ever like me- try to F you over and you had to take care of business or something? I've had, I've had people bail, like DIY people just kind of bail last minute when we you know on promises, like, you know, paying for certain things or releasing something and suddenly having something in my hand that I'm like, well, this is done and we just paid for it. Now it doesn't have a home and having to go search for a home for it. So, but you know, I, I, all those obstacles are, they're surmountable, you know, like that's, we're not, we're not talking about curing cancer or anything. It's all stuff that, you know, they're, they're beatable problems. So, right. There are solutions. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, I love the, the DIY spirit. Like, you know, you you have the label, you can put out your own releases, you can put out other people's releases, you're not beholden to anybody. And that's, I always love when people take control of that, because I don't know, when I was younger, I just always kind of waited for things to happen. And they never did. You guys are just showing up the parties and or showing up the shows and asking to play and you know, you have the label and you're just doing things yourself. I think that's great. And that's what we did with this podcast. I didn't wait for anybody to get back to me with anything i just said i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna figure out how and and here we are hell yeah and that's you know i love that you did that and that you know and thank you for 
you know, recognizing that's what I do as well. And that's like just doing things is always most of the battle. So if you just do it, it a lot of times things just fall into place. And uh, also not being beholden to people is that is oh, generally my number one priority. Um, Same. So, yeah. And uh, I, I just the only con I, I can point out in all that is sometimes it can put you in a bubble and you have to find ways to like fight that a little bit. But, you know, like you guys with this podcast, branching out to different people slightly into other scenes and stuff like that is the solution to that problem. Yes. Well, it will talk to anybody. Well, it's pretty much people in music, but anybody with a good story we'll talk to. We're not limited to one genre, that's for sure. Yeah, right on. Let's see. What else do you have? Now, you have a lot going on. You have plaque marks, too. I'm actually not playing in plaque marks any longer. You're not in plaque marks anymore. All right. This is breaking news. I have not heard this yet. <laughs> All right. Let's get the scoop right now. What is going on? Uh, I, It's been a minute now, but I guess towards the... I guess last summer, yeah, I just... We just parted ways. Uh, I believe they're going to keep going, but I will just, I'm just no longer playing with them. Just a difference in opinion on how things should be done. I see. Do you want to share the intimate details of those differences of opinion now on the show? Not really. I mean, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing that, there's, there's nothing that hasn't been, you know, it's just typical, just how things should be done and which direction things should go. And it just, it's just creative differences. Uh, you know, th- I have, uh, my mom always brings up, like, she goes, you know, I always liked that one kid that you hung out with. And I was like, in my head, I'm going, well, she can't be talking about anybody. Like, well, who is she talking about? Like, and she's like, <laughs> remember that kid, the one with the long hair? I'm like, Doug? And she always thought, like, she goes, I just always thought it was so interesting. He kind of beat, as she puts it, he uh, marched to the beat of his own drummer. He kind of just seemed to do his own thing. And I was like, yeah, that seems to be pretty much the whole trajectory of Doug's life. <laughs> Everything <laughs> it seems to be absolutely. like absolutely. And I, you know, I honestly respect that, and I, you know, I do that in some of my own ways as well. So I, you know, I respect the path Doug has taken for sure. Yes, and we're talking about Doug Sabalik of Plaque Marks and Ecstatic Vision. So, are, is everything cool? Do you guys still cool, or is there beef now, or is there going to be a, a war or something? I don't think there's anything like that. I mean, I. I like and respect those guys, you know. Uh, I, I've been a little outside of that world because of the pandemic and just, like, the choices I made in my own life. But, you know, everything's, as far as I'm concerned, copacetic. That's good to hear. All right, so what else do we have coming up? We've got Rid of Me, right? Now, this is the band with you and Iteria. Is it? Are we writing uh, similar tunes to what was going on in Low Dose? There's definitely a parallel, but it... Def, it went a little more post punk, um, so you can hear the low dose in it, which to me is a good thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a little more post punk. It's nice. the and you know different players always brings different elements. So you know it's a uh, Mike Howard is the drummer, and he was the second of three Fight Amp drummers. Uh, he also played in Ladder Devils, so he uh, yes he kind of brings his you know, drumming style to it. And he's, he's a very stripped down, hard hitting, like Dave Grohl esque drummer, which is awesome. Um, he also is really complimentary in the songwriting for the vision that we kind of had going into it when I, Terry and I started the band and then Ruben that plays in soul glow is the second guitar player. And, you know, he adds an element that we didn't really anticipate and is an awesome, like, cherry on top of the whole thing so that's awesome so you said you have a release coming up yeah so we during the pandemic we kind of did this like series of well we recorded our first lp in february of 20 or ep sorry a four song in uh february of 2020 right before i went on that plaque marks tour Mm -hmm. and then came home i was home for a couple weeks NBA season got canceled, which was to me always the moment, you know, it's a <laughs> and uh, NBA season gets canceled. Boom. Here we go. We're all staying home. And we were sitting up. We were like, oh, well, we were going to release this EP and go on this tour. So tour gets canceled. And, you know, we released the EP anyway. You know, DIY. It's cool. Four songs. And then during the pandemic, we, you know, in order to stay sane, wrote more stuff, traded files back and forth, eventually got back together 
released a couple more cassette tapes. Uh, one just came out with a Sheryl Crow cover on it. <laughs> oh, nice. What did you guys cover? Uh, uh, if It Makes You Happy. <laughs> I love that Yo, song. That's a good song. That's a really great song. <laughs> it is. Ch- ch- check it out. We, we slowed it down and downtuned it, so it's kind of cool. Um, See, I'll probably like it even better now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a fan of what we did with it. And uh, we recorded uh, another cover that hasn't come out yet. and You know, so kind of some piecemeal stuff. And, um, but that whole time we wrote and we're tracking the LP and we just finished it artwork and master maybe a month ago. It's got submitted to the plant. I'm doing a co-release like knife hits is doing the cassette and CD and digital and the ghost is clear records out of Kansas city is doing the vinyl. Um, I think we're going to announce in August with like a new song or two. And I think it'll come out in November. We're not quite there yet. We're waiting on the time from the pressing plant and stuff, but they quoted us in September, so we'll see. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, how about shows and tours and that kind of stuff? It looks like stuff is starting back up again. Uh, you got anything in the works? And uh, as far as shows and stuff go, we're definitely tiptoeing into it. More like, you know, uh, there's a lot of scenes just already out there going ape shit, which is cool. You know, I, I, I mean... I'm vaccinated. My whole band's vaccinated. It is what it is. Um, but we definitely are, you know, sort of tiptoeing into it a little more. Plus, we're a little more concerned about just playing shows when the record comes out more than anything. So I think right now there's like we're talking about maybe going to Virginia in October and playing a local show, our first local show in October, maybe a, a weekend down the North Carolina in November, our record release weekend in December, like up to Boston and you know, so we're, we're booking stuff for sure, but it's, uh, it's all like in the works and we're the, the whole thing about what's happening now is the venues are chomping at the bit because they have a financial incentive, of course, to make up for lost time. But DIY spaces without the financial incentive are really tiptoeing back into the world. So it's, there's a little bit of a, like, uh, a back and forth going on with, with, with you know, whether to go to DIY spaces and wait for them or just like jump right into like bar venues. Did you have any weird side effects from the COVID shots? I'm getting my second dose this week and I'm a little nervous. I got sick as hell, Uh, but I am a person that gets sick probably seasonally, you know, like I usually get some kind of flu ish thing like every year and a couple colds. I'm just that person. It is what it is. So I sort of expected it. They also say if you get a little sick, it's a, a sign of a good immune system. Um, and, you know, it's it's your body showing that it's reacting to what you're being in the bullshit you're getting injected with. Um, so I I got the J and J shot at one p.m. and I I felt stoned basically. So I kind of hung out and just ate food, and I was like, I I think I'm okay. And right around eight p.m. I was like, I don't think I'm okay. And I laid down and I was just done. I had fevers all night long break. I was wake. I woke up like six times, just like completely drenched my clothes and bed sheets. But that was the only symptom I had. Like normally when you have the flu or something, you also can't breathe because you're congested. And you're oh, yeah. like, uh, yeah, it was just, I was like, I could deal with a fever. I the just, nausea I don't... and the, yeah, yep. the, the body yeah. aches and everything. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say I had nothing from my first shot, but my second shot, I had such terror, like it was like, you know, when you're done the flu and you have that whole body, just weakness, like you just feel everything just makes you feel exhausted. Like, even I used to have the flu like every month. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Every time I try to kick, I feel like this, right? I just, even like, I remember I walked up to the top of the steps and I remember being like out of breath. And I, it, I panicked. I did that yep. like panicky, like, wait, do I already have COVID? And I'm like already out of breath. Oh hey, no. Yeah, and I just yeah. got, then I got the shot. Oh, and my immune system's fucked. Oh no. Like, and then I was just like, no, I'm okay. I can breathe again. I had the night of fevers. And then the next day, what you just described is what, what I had all day. And I just laid on, I laid on the couch and I was like, okay, at least the fevers are done. But I like couldn't get up and just ordered takeout, would get up and grab it and just eat it next to my you know, living room, my, my, my coffee, t- I'm lucky enough to live alone right now, which, you know, uh, if 
my roommate had moved out just a few months before that. And if he was here, it would have, I'm like, look, dude, you're going to have to leave. Like <laughs> I, I need the living room to myself, you know, that's yeah. After I felt better, I just felt better rapidly and it was fine. So that's interesting that you say, if you have symptoms after you get the shot, that's a good sign because it means your immune system is strong because it's fighting. It means so, it, it works. You know, there's, you're supposed to have a reaction, you know? It's, okay. So if I have no reaction, I'm going to be very scared now. No, I don't be, know. I know a lot. I, uh, yeah. I know a lot of people that I, I'm speaking and I'm not a scientist just so everyone knows. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're shitting me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. But I, yeah, I don't know. You know, like my, my dad, he's 70 years old. He has zero symptoms from the second shot. So that's, is what it is you know I'm, I'm sure you'll be fine i wouldn't mind feeling high after the shot it would be like a free lapse so i guess we're gonna find out yeah so what do you do to pass the time you're involved in a lot of music you've got rid of me you've got anxiety spiral you've got knife hits record what do you do to unwind or is it just all music all the time no it's not all music all the time i would lose my mind um <laughs> that's yeah uh a lot of stuff i don't know uh hiking video games i'm playing video games all the time what have you been playing lately i generally lean towards retro gaming uh nice. so what I, are you playing right now all right here's what i'm working on right now i play okay i play everquest sometimes still I play oh yeah i no play shit. Uh, okay i play the original doom still Hell they yeah. have like different servers where you can play online uh That's I'm, awesome i'm usually working on a, a quake map of some sort there's like a different there's like a lot of quake mods out there uh legend of zelda the first one i just replayed the entire Mega Man series on nes i did that uh, about a year ago uh on on switch because they put out a package of every single og Mega Man game and i finally beat some that i didn't beat in my youth so i was happy with yeah that. i never played yeah. past three i think when i was a kid what are your favorites i'm a Mega Man two and a Mega Man three guy yeah same but two, two is my favorite. Three is my second favorite. Exactly. And I, would say, I would say one is my first, is my third favorite. So one is so hard. It's, it's ridiculously crazy. hard. Yeah. Do you know that boss who like disassembles and then reassembles on the other side of the screen? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> that <laughs> it was so hard. I I literally thought like I'm never going to beat this. Yeah. I I. Think back to when I was a kid, and I don't know how I actually got as far as I did in some of those games back then. When I play yeah. them now, I'm like, I don't, I don't. It really was just me, you know, looking out and seeing my friends riding their bikes, and I was like, I don't think so. I think I gotta, I gotta really buckle down and, and beat this guy. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, since I'm six years old, I always just wanted to sit inside and play video games. It's been like that my whole life. I can relate. Yeah. No, I'm glad to hear that. I'm not alone. And with with NES games, the rep the repetition is just crazy. Like I used to be I used to be able to do a whole run of Legend of Zelda and not consult any maps or anything. And when I think about that now, I think that's crazy. Yeah, the last time I played the first Legend of Zelda on NES, I I told myself I wasn't going to use guides and I used guides like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I don't, I was like, I don't have time for this shit. I, I think I got to look some stuff up. I don't uh, even mess I, around anymore. Like my, the desktop image of my PC is the legend of Zelda map. So I just uh, go nice. and check it. Yeah, there you go. Yep. But currently I am playing a uh, super Mario RPG on SNES, um, which I haven't replayed in since I was younger. Uh, I have a hacked SNES classic, so I have it loaded up with a ton of ROMs and a bunch of like ROM hacks and Japanese only games and stuff. So nice, yeah, yeah. Gaming is good. I like retro stuff. I like new stuff. What what's been good lately? Final Fantasy VII remake, good. Last of Us Two, good. I didn't play the Seven remake. I love the original. Yeah, and my brother spoiled the ending for me, and I really do not like what they did with the ending, and it made me just not want to play it in general. And I might be a total asshole cutting off my nose to spite my face with that decision, but uh, that's the decision I made. I was like, you know what, I'm not going to play it. I also don't have a console to play that game, so yeah, that kind of helped with the decision. <laughs> well. Get, maybe give it a shot later. I understand, though, because Final Fantasy VII, the original, is like my Bible, basically. I think it's the best story ever. I think it's the best game music ever. I think it's just the top of the top. Me too. Yeah, Seven Remake does change some things. Not a ton, but some. 
but I did like it. Okay. I mean, exploring that world further is intriguing to me, of course. You know, yeah. that's, uh, I would like to see Six get a remake, though, because that's a world that could use some expanding upon. You know, I've never played any except Seven. Are you serious? Yeah. Six is my favorite. Seven's my second favorite. Whoa. I'm going to have to look into this. But both have their uh, pros and cons where I, I sort of wish there was a way to jam those two games together. You know, that's, does uh, six have a better story? Mm, no, I don't. I don't. Some people might argue, but I don't think so. But it definitely has a lot of better gameplay elements. I see. Um, I'm about a third of the way through Metroid right now. Oh, Not yeah. Prime. You know, I, I can't get into the original Metroid for NES. It's like too monotonous. But Super Metroid, I love. It's very, it's a very confusing game in that sometimes worlds literally are duplicated, but with just different coloring. I haven't played that one in a while, and I tried, and I, it was tough. But I replayed a uh, um, Super Metroid maybe two years ago, and I loved it still. Um, yeah, Super Metroid is unbelievably good. I, I love the the alien influence is in those games is so cool. That's, you know, uh, the movie alien. Okay. We covered the rid of me stuff. I have the LP coming out in November. That's my main jam right now. We're doing, uh, doing some like podcast recordings, this like, you know, live recordings, uh, this week. Are any of the podcast recordings going to be better than this one? Uh, my, my guess is no, but l- <laughs> let me hear it from you. It's just not possible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> none of them will talk to me about final fantasy seven so there's the answer <laughs> that's uh, what makes this show so unique <laughs> <laughs> yeah um other than that um anxiety spiral is my side project at the moment and um we recorded initial instruments like maybe six months ago it kind of got put on the for for a new four song uh whatever you want to call it ep release um we're not sure what we're doing with it yet and I it got put on the back burner because we were finishing the Rhythm LP, which I self engineered a lot of that record, um, and I'm also self engineering the Anxiety Spiral uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. So my my time is that's something I did during the pandemic was you know up my engineering skills, and I I actually learned how to use Pro Tools. Finally, I was in some uh, archaic programs, and uh, so that's something that I'm looking forward to getting out there is the new anxiety spiral stuff. And I think we're going to get a second guitar player and talk about playing some shows in the fall as well. So awesome. You know, you just reminded me, I remember seeing you on Twitter and you said you were recording vocals for some band in your house and your neighbors thought someone was being killed or something. Is do I have that correct? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, you know, that's, I, I'm on the vocal mic right now that I, you know, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, I have like a mini studio down here. It's I can't record drums, but I can pretty much do everything else. And uh, I don't know if it was probably Anxiety Spiral uh, songs that I was recording when the neighbors thought I was being killed. But uh, it could have been rid of me, too, because I Terry has, you know, got a shriek. Yeah, she's got a she's got a real powerful voice. And I, I like that. I, I would be too self-conscious to record vocals at home because of that exact situation. I'd be like, what if they hear me? What if they think I'm dying? I, I I used to feel that way, and then I just got used to it. It's just a matter of doing it over and over and over again. So how did you learn to use Pro Tools? Because this is something that I want to do as well. I just started demoing in it and, and using it. It's just that, you know, that, and uh, I'm still not really ready to get into it to do like a full LP because I there's a learning curve and I feel like I just need more demoing time inside that program and I know some other programs as well. So, but I'm trying to uh, eventually just transfer all the way over to Pro Tools. It's just a I'm learning it just by using it and by using it it's when I have new song ideas I jump into the program and start recording it. Yeah, that's awesome. I I really want to be able to do that cuz I haven't played any music in a long time and I want to and if I could just put together songs by myself without other people, that's the that's the premier situation right there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it definitely helped me a ton being being able to have an idea, and if I happen to be home when I get that idea, I can run to my basement and just start recording it. Well, Mike, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show and speak with us today. I haven't spoken to you in a long time, so it was good to catch up. It's always nice to have friends on. I mean, shit, you've created a ton of good music. 
that we both dig. And uh, so I just want to say thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's awesome. There you have it, folks. Mike McGinnis. Excellent conversation. Man, he's doing a lot in music. I really like that. I love the DIY spirit. And one thing that we were talking about with Mike, Tommy, after the, after the uh, microphone shut off, just the sheer amount of, we always say this, but the sheer amount of scenes and scenes within scenes and good music that came from our tri-state area is just immeasurable. And Mike being a part of that, too. Like, they're doing their thing over in Jersey, and I don't know. I Like, I never even saw them. It's crazy to think about. I think I saw Fight Amp twice. Yeah, it was just kind of astounding. Like, when you think about the amount of music that was just, you know, stuff that still holds up 20 years later. Yes. That was coming out from literally, like, a 50 square miles. <laughs> like, it's, it's fucking nuts. Like, it's, it's really yeah. cool. Just a, a ton of great music, and it's always nice to uh, to have people on the show and and connect with them and and do a deep dive. Because I've I've been around Mike a bunch and we've talked, but never like to that level. You know what I mean? Oh, of course. Yeah, I was. We were saying when the well, actually when the mics went off, I I've met him a handful of times, but usually in the capacity of hey, can I get a Jameson on the rocks? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's what it always was. It was like he was working at you know, Kung Fu necktie. So, and it's always busy. People don't have a chance to talk like, so no. tell us about uh, the scene where you grew up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, what? No, I, I always was so mangled when I went there, you know, I don't remember half of it. I actually, there was a time I went there and I, I, I think I've told you this before, but it was, uh, I think a life once lost was playing there. And I, had such a bad time in terms of uh, uh, consumption that I, I had to sit down and, and <laughs> Meadows had to like grab me. He was like, come here, move it, move, get out of the booth, get out of these booths. Like my friend needs to sit down. <laughs> like, oh yeah. I remember that. that yeah. Oh yeah. That was one of those times where, uh, you know, room was spinning and uh, it was nine thirty at night. Not a good night. Well, I was thinking about it recently. One time I was there and I was on various things and I was just like, so I felt like such shit. So I was just sitting at the bar by myself, like head down, just like miserable, feeling miserable. And then I'm leaving and this girl walks up and hands me a piece of paper. And I'm like, I thought she was like giving me a, fl a flyer for a show. And I was like, I was like, Hey, I know you, you're so-and-so's friend. And like, she, she was giving me her phone number. <laughs> and I, I was like so out of it I didn't I couldn't even comprehend she's like I'm giving you my number I was like what and I was like oh okay oh thank thank you are these all your numbers okay <laughs> do I do I type all of them into the phone what <laughs> no but and it's also nice to like just talking about that time I think the other thing that you kind of nailed which was like people that do music that they love and make their own way in it uh they you know no, they've made the records, they've recorded the records, they've done the engineering, they played all the instruments on it, and on top of that, they've taken ownership of the distribution of it. Like, yes, they, they, that's a really like you know they they own all of the from beginning to end. It's entirely within their control. I love that. That's what we do with this show. I wish I knew how to do all this stuff when I was younger. I was so out of it when I was younger. I didn't know how to do anything or talk to people or. Or whatever, but like with this show now, we just we just do it. It's nice when people do DIY DIY stuff, especially when uh, they know they 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 get to control the end product and they love it, and they they or they work with people that they trust to be able to do the right thing. Exactly, exactly, and that's what we do with this show. Yeah. And speaking of this show, Tommy, I want to give a shout out to Adam Harris. He is running a site, a Facebook site, Furnace Fest twenty twenty one furnace fest unofficial they're posting about bands over there it's like a group for furnace fest but they're also doing a podcast now so let me give them a shout out furnace fest hangs on apple podcasts and i assume it's on other mediums too check it out yeah so check out adam's page on facebook it's uh unofficial is it called friends of furnace fest is that what it is 
I forget. I already said it, though, so yeah, just no, rewind. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There you go. That's it. I think we covered it all. Yeah, we did a nice job with this one. I really like talking to people. And I, you know what's funny, though, is I think this is one of those things that when we talk about, like, you kind of, like, lead the, sh- like, you know, where we're going with the conversation. Yes. It, my ears perk up as soon as somebody says skateboarding. <laughs> Yeah, I I know I know there's going to be a skateboarding conversation, and then I know I'm going to have to yank the show back from it. But that's okay. That's why there's two of us, Tommy. That's true. But I also really like yo know, that dude uh, that he mentioned. If that kid's listening right now, Big Kev, that dude fucking rules. He was the nicest guy. Always fucking hilarious. If you're listening out there, Big Kev, thank you so much. He's been a fucking super dope dude all over the years. Yeah, I remember him and that whole crew. They were they were good people. They were fun to hang out with. And uh, so shout out to those dudes. And listen, I'm going to remind everybody again. Write to us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We love to hear from you and get show flyers and all that stuff to post. Rate us on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star review because I'm too fragile to handle any less than that. <laughs> Write a nice review if you like the show. We'll read it on the air. And there's something else. Oh yeah, like us on you like our videos on YouTube, subscribe to us on YouTube, uh follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, you know, all the stuff. Like all the stuff that you have to do to support a podcast. Just do that stuff for us. We appreciate it. I honestly I make a point of any time you post a new video, except I hadn't done I didn't do it today yet, but I go in and I, I always make sure I press like. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you know, YouTube is my preferred format. So, yeah, it's how I listen to all my music, basically, except for I have my old uh, 60 gig iPod that I hook up once in a while and, and listen to everything on there. So, well, that's it for this one, folks. We've said it all and we've done it all and we will be back next week. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And until next time. Yay!